everyone. My name is Randolph Brazier and I'm Head of Innovation at the Energy Networks Association. Today we are going to be talking about what energy networks are doing to modernise their data and make it available to you. After a brief overview of BNA's work, you will see two demonstrators of digital system map that we have created, one from Steve Field at SP Energy Networks and one from Matt Webb at UK Power Networks. First to the introduction, ENA represents the gas and electricity networks at transmission and distribution in the UK and Ireland. You can see in the bottom left in yellow, we have the gas networks, and in the top right in, in red, we have the electricity networks, all of which are our members. Set up a new data working group. This working group was set up to ensure consistency in energy data across the UK and Ireland, which in turn will improve how we operate our networks and support our customers, you. We work closely with Bayes, Ofgem and Innovate UK, including sitting on the advisory group for their Modernising Energy Data Access or MEDA competition, which will be kicking off soon. All of the energy networks have now launched their own individual digitalisation strategies, you can find these on our website, which will be highlighted at the end of this uh, video. EMA will be running a range of stakeholder engagement events and producing interactive content such as this, as we want to ensure what we do works for you. And finally, the ENA Data Working Group is supporting the delivery of the Energy Data Task Force report recommendations, including working on demonstrators of the digital systems map which you'll hear about later in this video. If you've not already read it, I would strongly recommend that you read the Energy Data Task Force report. To be honest, it was a game-changing report that made five key recommendations for modernising energy data, and it is available for download on the Energy Systems Catapult website. You can see the front cover of the report there on the right-hand side. All of the energy networks have now launched their own individual digitalisation strategies. As you know, the energy industry is undertaking a huge transformation, one from a one-way traditional system to a smart, flexible system with electricity flowing in multiple directions and green gas being produced by renewable resources. There's a, a, a picture of this on the right-hand side, as you can see. Energy networks are already somewhat digitalised, but we need to go further increase our speed, collaborate on standardisation and make data available to our customers. We need to create digitalised networks and make appropriate investments that are driven for you, our customers and our stakeholders. Digitalisation strategies have been produced in line with the Energy Data Task Force report that I mentioned earlier. We will also be taking guidance from the data best practice document produced by the Energy Systems Catapult, as well as, as well as our stakeholders. The best practice document can also be found on the Energy Systems Catapult website, and they are also looking for feedback and comments on that, so please do get in contact with them. EMA wants your input to our strategies. We will explain how you can get involved in this and how you can provide that feedback at the end of my presentation. The aim of these documents is to increase transparency about our plans to improve use and availability of energy data. And there are a number of common themes across the strategies, as you can see on this diagram here. Ultimately, we believe that these strategies will play a key role in opening up our data for customers and helping to transition to net zero, which networks are absolutely central to. Albeit a key one, the ENA Data Working Group is only one part of the data journey for ENA. As you can see here, a range of other initiatives are being undertaken by ENA to support this work. If I were to pick out two key projects, the Open Networks Project and the Gas Goes Green project at the top there. These are two of our key strategic future looking projects at ENA. These two projects in particular are enabling the energy transition and ensuring that energy networks help facilitate the transition to a smart, flexible energy system. 
Data is key to pretty much all of the work being undertaken at EMA. And the data working group is the tool that we will be using to coordinate and govern all data related activity, as you can see on this screen. This is not an exhaustive list. How you guys can get involved. Should you want further information about the work that the ENA Data Working Group is undertaking, please visit our webpage for more information, which you can see on the screen now. You can also sign up to our future networks projects that were just discussed on the previous slide, the Open Networks Project and the Gasco's Green Project, where you can also follow this work. Now, without further ado, I'll hand over to Steve and Matt. I do hope you enjoy the rest of the video and please do not hesitate to get in touch with us to learn more. Thank you. And welcome to this presentation from the Energy Networks Association Data Working Group. This is a presentation about the digital system map. And my name is Steve Field. The Energy Data Task Force in their report on a strategy for a modern digitalized energy system produced a number of recommendations. Amongst that was a recommendation that a unified digital system map of the energy system should be established. Specifically, the task force recommended uh, that the digital system map should be interoperable and should reuse uh, resources and utilize learning from other activities. One of these was the uh, Australian uh, digital system map, uh, the Arimi project. There'll be a separate presentation on that. The task force also recommended that uh, system actors should use existing data sets to build a map, and I'm going to show you that shortly. Um, and that the digital system map should be independent, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. What I'm going to show today is actually a proof of concept to identify that we, we use to identify some of the challenges that will be involved in combining different data sets to create a unified digital system map. The specific example we've picked is the electricity network capacity maps, sometimes known as heat maps. Uh, and to narrow it down, we've actually focused on uh, creating an all Scotland heat map. Um, what I'm going to show you uses the ESRI ArcGIS online platform, um, but that no way indicates what the final solution might be. That's still to be analysed and go through a, a program. I should, however, express my thanks to all the people who've been involved in this, including Esri, who've helped create this demonstration. So I'm going to now show you what the digital system map, uh, heat map, looks like. I'm going to start off, hopefully, you're seeing now a view of all of the UK transmission assets, gas and electricity. Um, and uh, there's a legend that describes all the different parts of the network. I can also flick on different layers of data in here, um, and we'll see some of these as we drill into more detail. Um, maybe a useful one to show just now is the GSP group boundaries for the electricity distribution network. Um, so you can see where the owners of the different parts of the energy network are from having a map like that. That could be one first useful point. As I start to scroll into more detail, we'll start to see more detail appearing on the map. And this now starts to look a little bit more like the heat maps um, that you might see from the individual companies. Um, so I've actually got the heat maps here on the uh, separate slide here. So th these are public websites anybody can get access to. Um, this is the Scottish Power, the south of Scotland uh, heat map. and this is the uh, Scottish and Southern heat map for the north of Scotland. So you see they look quite different. And what this is doing is bringing them all together in one, one location. Again, as I scroll into a bit more detail, I start to see more information appearing on the map. So now we're seeing the distribution network. Uh, mapped out the electricity distribution network and this is covering all of the UK and I'll flick that uh, that 
boundary on again, just to remind ourselves where the boundary between the Scottish and Southern up here and Scottish power in the South here is. Um, but we've also brought in more detail than that. We've actually brought in the full gas distribution network as well. Um, and you'll see that now refreshing on the map. So this map does contain a lot of uh, information all in one place. And we've been able to do this relatively quickly. Most of the um, network companies have got their asset information digitized in um, in electronic form and we can bring them together into a map like this. I'm going to start turning some of these layers off now because it does get quite complicated when you drill, keep that level of detail on. So I'm going to turn the distribution uh, um, cables and gas pipes off uh, altogether for now. So we're back to showing a map of the Areas in the network where there is capacity to install uh, additional generation with the red, amber, green showing you the, 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 where the capacity exists. Each of these points has got information sit, sitting behind it. So I click on one of these points. So I can see the information, some information uh, that's, that's uh, related to that particular point. Um, but interestingly, when we looked at the information that exists on the two heat maps, that level of information is different. And also, when we go into the detail of these heat maps, if I drill in a bit on this one, for example, uh, you will see that uh, I, I start to see more information on the map, but it's the same information of that about the primary substations and GSPs on the uh, on this particular heat map here, as I drill in, I start to see more information about the cables as well, cables and, and overhead lines. So there is difference between the, the two maps. There's also a difference between the level of information that exists in here. There's a reasonable amount of information uh, in this particular heat map. And on here, it's a slightly different set of information. Um, so this is the kind of things that we know we're going to struggle with or we're going to have to overcome when we combine this information. For now, all we've done is um, kind of minimize, reduce this to the uh, <clears throat> common set of data between both sets of data sets. Um, <clears throat> there are some functionality that I can show you that uh, this, this tool is capable of doing. So if, for example, you were interested in um, exporting a chunk of data from this, this map, then you can do that. Um, you can select over an area and uh, the information that's been uh, selected, then you can export that out in various different formats. Um, you can also um, filter the data out as well. Um, if you want to see particular a particular focus, at the moment it can look a bit cluttered if I uh, a little bit can look quite cluttered. If I'm interested in where have I got capacity to install um, generation onto the network, then I can use the filters to decide that I'm only interested in looking at the areas that are green on this list. I can obviously print off the, the map as well, um, and I can add additional data onto the map if I'm interested in that. Um, there's a lot of information. This, this is the Esri's own curated data set, and you can see there's two, two and a half thousand pages of items that could be added on. Um, if I just search for UK data, for example, um, 104 pages of data that could get added onto this map if some of these were relevant to you. You can also add your own data on. Um, I've actually got an example of looking at some electric vehicle charge points. If I added those charge points onto this map, you see, uh, I, I, this is this is information that's also available publicly, um, and uh, you can start to see the sort of use case that might come out of this. So, if, for example, I'm interested in uh, where is the capacity on the network to use electric vehicle <clears throat> charge points to possibly put uh, uh, energy back onto the network. 
then there's some areas that stand out here that <clears throat> have got capacity on the network and also have a high number of EV charge points. So that was a very quick tour around what a digital system map could look like for uh, this particular uh, example of um, generation availability on the network. Um, what we're interested in is feedback on that. What kind of use cases are people interested in? What kind of data would people like to see on the network? Um, and what kind of facilities and functions would you like to see? As I've mentioned, there will be a separate presentation around the Australian example of a map which was referenced in the Energy Data Task Force report. Um, so once you've viewed that and, and this presentation, then please uh, use the links that will be available to send us your feedback. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Matt Webb. I'm just going to give you a demonstration of the Arimi spatial data platform, uh, which is uh, something that's been employed for several years in Australia, not just for the energy industry, uh, but for various sectors. Um, and it provides a very, very powerful tool um, that uh, I'll walk you through in terms of uh, giving what's described as a data journey. So step by step, I'll take you through various use cases and demonstrate some of the functionality within the tool. Um, hopefully it gives you a good insight into uh, the art of the possible in this space and what we aspire uh, to achieve within the UK, uh, working collaboratively through the ENA. Um, I'm by no means an expert on this. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be a good demonstration of how intuitive and, and, and easy to use the tool is by virtue of the fact that you know I have not been uh, involved in the development or creation of this tool in any way, shape or form. Uh, I'm literally just somebody that's been introduced to it and, and giving you this overview. So um, I will dive right in. I'll just uh, remove that to give you a nice clean screen. So um, in terms of the platform, we start off with uh, a, a disclaimer about its use. So I'll just pass through that. Um, I'll go yes to, so you want to view the data story. Um, and yeah, this is the, this is the, the, the core interface. So um, various controls on the left-hand side, main viewer, the uh, white banner across the bottom of the screen there is effectively the narrative for the data story. So please read through that as I uh, talk around each demonstration. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll kick off with sort of the, the actual insights um, that the tool provides to us. So what we have here in terms of visualization is a very, very simplistic view where if we grab this um, scroll device here, if I come to the right, this is displaying the gas network in Australia. And if I drag it to the left, this is displaying the electrical network. So it's it's able to give you a very simple to use view of uh, both uh, networks and their interaction. So where this comes into its own, if we zoom in on Sydney here, uh, I'll bring up the window. So let me go in. So yeah, zooming in on Sydney, where you get a far more congested area, and I'll just let this catch up for us. So you can see along the top here, you've got a banner for uh, sort of the processing. You can see we've got a far more congested network. What I will do, given that um, amount of time it's taking to refresh, what you can do on the map function here is you can see you've got various base map uh, options. And on the bottom of this window here, you are able to uh, shift the balance between quality and performance. Uh, so if you want uh, a faster refresh and, and um, are willing to compromise the quality of the space slightly, you can move it to the right as I just have. Or if you want really high quality but are willing to have a, a slightly lower buffer speed, um, then you can move it to the left. So I've moved it there for the sake of this uh, demonstration. So as I move this to the left, as you can see, we've got all the electrical network there. And as I come across, just the gas network. So if I zoom in on Liverpool just here, Obviously not Liverpool UK, Liverpool Sydney. Um, this is where it becomes increasingly useful. So you can see that close interaction between the two networks just by pulling from left to right. And you can see around the M31 there, you've got that interaction of the two networks. So as I say, just a very simple, um, quite elegant way of, of looking at the interaction between gas and electrical networks. So moving on to the next example. Okay, we'll just give it a second to refresh. So uh, what we have here is, as you can probably uh, uh, 
case yourselves is a view of the electricity network and uh, its corresponding um, generation sites. Uh, and but effectively by clicking on any one of these sites, I'll start with this one in the middle here. Here you have a hydroelectric power station um, with some associated information about that power station. And along the bottom here, some time series data. So if I just bring this to the front, expand, and here you can basically select different time frames um, for the time series data. So I'm going to click on seven days. And this will bring up a more detailed view along the bottom here, again, of that time series data. And you can see by tracing along this in the bottom right hand corner, just over here as I move and it jumps, um, bottom right hand corner of the screen there, you can see the specific information for that very point in time. So as I pull across, it shows that output. So this is hydroelectric. And if I close this example, there is then a further example just further north here towards Canberra. I will select, and this is solar. So if I do exactly the same and look at the the time series data of the output on here, we'll expanding it to seven days. You can have the overlay looking at those two sides of the hydro and the PV. Um, so you can see a far more conventional um, daytime load profile for the PV as opposed to um, the uh, hydroelectric. And clearly the, the, the difference in the outputs. So again, very simple, very easy to use a tool and a way of comparing outputs from uh, power stations. Equally, you can select circuits if you wish. And again, bring up some, some basic data around that. So moving on to the next demo. Yeah, allowing it to refresh once again. So this particular view is, is my favorite, to be honest. So um, what has been done here is there has been a false color palette applied uh, to the visualization to give higher contrast. And what you're looking at here is um, satellite imagery uh, from Sentinel-2 satellites. Um, and this is updated four times a day. And what you're actually seeing here is the effects of um, the uh, bushfires that happened earlier in the year. So clearly this is a, a, a snapshot of an actual bushfire where you've got this, the scorched area in the middle of the screen here and the active um, margin of, of, of the fire that's, that's happening at the moment to the north here and to the northeast. Equally, you can see the current smoke and from that obviously um, determine that there is a um, southeasterly uh, travel. Uh, so you can see the wind is coming from the, the northwest. And uh, the key thing is with this is, okay, how is this going to impact the network and, and our assets? So you can clearly see that we have network assets here. If I click on uh, this point object, it will come up and it's a substation, just giving that a second to load in. So yeah, as I was saying, it's a uh, 132 KB substation um, and directly in the path of travel. Similarly, you've got the overhead network here, 132 KV again, directly in, in the path of travel. So as a network operator, at least um, you can assess the risk posed um, in relatively near real time, as I say, four times a day, this is being refreshed. So if you understand the weather forecast and are looking at those refreshes as they come in, um, you've got a good chance of anticipating what, where and when your assets are going to be at risk and to try and intervene wherever possible. Clearly, you can see here the, the fringe of this particular bushfire is, is becoming you know, um, quite critical in terms of its proximity to this network, with it being overhead now, it's particularly exposed. So, um, you know, uh, we don't quite suffer in the same way in the UK as they do in Australia with bushfires, but there have been examples um, in the north of England over recent years and Scotland uh, with peat fires and, you know, damage can be um, uh incurred from those. Equally, where I think there's an even stronger use case in the UK is around uh, uh, flooding. So, you know, the same principle applies. Uh, where we get flood forecasts, there's no reason why we can't overlay that sort of data in this and look at that risk and, and potential impact to our network. So again, moving on to the next demonstration, I just allow me to refresh through. So what we have here is um, a heat map for showing the data from the 15 suppliers um, that participate in this uh, within Australia. 
So effectively, um, the heat map is showing the available capacity for each of these network areas. So what I would do is rather than have it at this high level, I'll zoom into Brisbane here where things are a little bit more interesting. Um, so you can see um, the darker green is where there is high capacity and you can see the key on the left hand side here um, and red where it's more constrained. So I'll click on this more constrained area here. And it brings up, I'm going to bring it to the front for you. Um, again, some um, outline information about the um, area. Um, growth rate of um, demand, proposed investment um, to release capacity and basically a, a, a set of time series data showing the, the uh, well, it's not time series data, is it? But basically showing year on year uh, the available capacity and associated forecast right the way through to 2028, where you can see um, uh, deficit of 15.2 MBA. So visually very, very useful for quickly seeing where you have um, uh, limited uh, uh, capacity on the network effectively. So building on that and coming into a, a slightly more detailed view on this occasion around Melbourne, um, you can use the time series controls within the tool to scroll through year on year. So what I would do is I will come back to 2020. And what I would suggest is if we focus on this area uh, in the sort of yellowy color here. So as I scroll through year on year, you can see how capacity is becoming increasingly constrained where things get interesting is in 2026, it suddenly turns green. So clearly that's indicating there is some sort of intervention there. So back to 25, 26. So if we select that particular area, again, similar information to what you just have just seen, but you can see here that in 2026, you have that risk capacity through uh, some form of intervention. Um, so it's very useful for understanding um, planned activities and, you know, when are, uh, when is there going to be increased capacity available on that network? So again, building on that, I'll just let this refresh through while I'm talking. Um, you can use similar data sets to identify deferral hotspots. Um, so clearly there's a, a standout area here, again in Melbourne, this is in the uh, area so I'll just centralize that for you by selecting that you can see um, on this occasion information on deferral value so you can see it's a dock area again uh, various information this time including total investment in uh, millions of dollars when it's planned um, when the constraint is currently occurring again forecast demand growth so on and so forth so a lot of really valuable information in there and then it shows um, the um, total deferral value um, profile over time. Closing that down and just going on. And just give us a second to refresh. So this is exactly the same area of network, um, just slightly more zoomed in. Um, and just to demonstrate some of the navigation tools you have on the right here. So clearly you can see you've got a slight perspective view here. By using this uh, tool here, you can directly alter that. You can always get a bit carried away, not interested on underneath, so it's quite sensitive. Um, but you can give yourself a different level of perspective. You can rotate around very easily. Again, I'll try to give that a slightly better angle. There we are. So if you're prospecting and trying to assess an area, you can you know, have a really good explore. Equally on the left here, you've got uh, just a, a scroll tool to change the opacity. So you can see the detail um, of the area. And again, you can see it's a dock area. You can see the, the boat's moored here. And it's obviously um, a typical um, Docklands area, some storage, railway lines coming through, uh, so on and so forth. So when you're uh, assessing these areas, there's a lot of um, functionality just to get a good feel for what's there and so on. So again, moving on to the next step, staying with this area. Um, by turning on um, the proposed investment layer, so it's already been done for us, but effectively on the left here, each of these boxes is a different layer. So you can see the proposed investment layer has been switched on here by that uh, box being uh, filled. And what that is doing is showing these planned investments, these dots that you can see on the screen here. So for the, this particular uh, dock area, if I click on this uh, point object, 
Um, didn't need to do that, sorry, there we go. There we are, sorry about that. Um, so what it's showing is uh, some of the similar information you've already seen, type of area, uh, in investment value, investment year, and then uh, some additional information. Uh, there is some additional data. Here we are, that's what I was after. So um, again, just given a bit more insight into the, the nature of the uh, assets, when that investment is going to be made, the annual deferral value um, in dollars, um, and yeah, just lots and lots of value, valuable information to inform activities in that space and any potential opportunities for um, deferring that investment. So moving on to the next view. So similar to what I demonstrated before, by clicking on this area, what you can also do is bring up um, Again, a, a time series view for percentage of capacity. Um, so using the controls on the left here, you can see at the moment it's set to 5 p.m. If I expand this to bring up similar banner to what I had before, again, you can scroll along and, and uh, particular times, but correspondingly, you can change the view on the heat map. So if I come back a few hours in the day on the left here, just bear with me while it's just catching up to me. So starting at 10 a.m., you can see that the actual base map has, has changed in terms of its, its color to show the intensity, and that is reflecting the data that you have in the, the two time series, either the, the high level view here or the more detailed view. Um, and as you scroll through 11, 12 o'clock, midday, 1 o'clock, and so on, you can see um, how um, the visualization changes and corresponds with the time series data. So again, just giving you that extra level of, of, of insight and detail, um around this so again moving on to the next step of the story so that's everything in terms of that particular use case bear with me again while this refreshes so um again slightly different use case uh, to the previous um more akin to the bushfire one but this one is about um solar generation so similar tool to what we had in the very first example with the gas electricity networks. But if I scroll this all the way to the right, this is effectively showing um, solar radiation um, in the winter. And if I scroll to the left, this is showing the level of solar radiation in the summer. So you should expect um, far greater um, solar radiation in the, in the summer months around December. Um, but clearly what this is doing is helping to identify where are there good sites for investment in, in um, solar farms. So if I put this in the sort of center position again, you can see quite nicely that just here, there's a, there's a sweet spot in Australia, just, just north of central, this band running east to west, where year round you've got good um, uh, solar radiation levels. Um, equally, um, these areas that you can see in green, um, they are protected areas effectively. So if I click on one of those, it brings up that this example is an indigenous protected area. Uh, so therefore it's highly unlikely or very, very challenging to get permission to invest in those areas. So just again, in terms of prospecting for potential sites for PV, really, really useful tool in terms of where you're gonna get maximum output, where are there gonna be um, constraints and limitations in the way you can build and develop. Again, moving on to the next case. This on this one, this one can be a little bit slow, so let's just let it run through. If I do it, I'll skip forward one and come back. There we go.
Okay, so in this example, um, effectively, it's about trying to um, identify and scope new generation connections. So quite simply, um, there's a um, heat map uh, applied to specific circuits and substations. So again, the key is on the left here, um, and you can see that we have various point sites and circuits. So if I was to select this particular substation here, um, it's giving you information on the level of available capacity, 5 megawatts in this example, um, and any constraints that exist. Um, so just some good basic information about potential capacity at that site. Equally with the circuits, if I click on this example here, you can see similar information at circuit level, again, um, potential generation capacity. 64 megawatts in this example. So, you know, good headroom there um, and any associated constraints. Um, so yeah, just in terms of being able to identify where is there immediately available capacity or not, really, really useful, very straightforward and, and um, uh, uh, a powerful tool um, to, to save a lot of time and, and, and um, sort of pointless inquiries, trying to find out whether there is availability there or not. Um, so yeah, as simple as that on that one. As we move on to the next example. So slightly different uh, on this one. So what I'm going to demonstrate here is the ability to um, import your own data. So um, what I have is some uh, immediately uh, available um, UK data sets, which I'm going to pull in, um, overhead lines and substations, not dissimilar to the view you just had. Um, but the reality is you can pull any spatial data set in that you like, and the tool has the ability to um, uh, plot that automatically with minimal effort. So if you um, have um, third party data sets, you can pull those in. So it's say environmental data, your own assets, so on and so forth. So it's really, really useful. So I'll just quickly demonstrate to you how straightforward this is. So as I say, uh, existing data sets that I have, I'm only going to use two of the three I've got here. So if I drag and drop these overhead lines examples, click upload. Just give it a second to run through. You can see it's now downloaded that data and instantly plotted it for me. And I will just re repeat that again with the substation data. Point across, upload. And again, that'll be available. So exactly as we were doing uh, with the Australian examples there, we can navigate around and I will be parochial and zoom into a bit of network I'm familiar with. So here um, around Dartford and the Dartford crossing, the equivalent with the second bridge, you can see we have all the circuits plotted and corresponding substations. So if I click on this substation here in the orange, brings up the outline information we have with it. So clearly the information you have is dependent on um, what you provide within the original data set. But it immediately, you know, will present that for you um, without any uh, significant effort and configuration. Uh, it's literally just drag and drop was all I, I, I did. Um, and similarly with the corresponding circuits, um, I can click on that and it'll bring up the corresponding information and highlight its full extent. So, yeah, just really, really um, simple to use, very powerful. And as I say, not limited in any way in terms of the sort of data you can pull in. So if you're interested in the interaction between any uh, physical, uh, environmental network type features, you can quickly integrate those yourselves in addition to the data sets that are native to the application um, to, to be able, able to do all sorts of assessment and analysis. And then moving on to this final um, use case, again, slightly different, this one focused on hydroelectric. So um, clearly what you've got here is um, some bodies of water mapped out and corresponding hydroelectric sites. So as with all other demos, you click on that and it'll give you a, 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 a set of information on this, talking about the um, physical features um, at that site, the height of the head, um, average slope, so on and so forth. So all of those factors that are clearly very, very important and of interest um, in hydroelectric generation. You can see there's a number of sites plotted here. In terms of um, trying to identify potential, just the um, ability to quickly navigate around and, and have a series of views. So uh, clearly what we've got here is, is a 3D representation. Um, and again, using the, the navigation tools that we had before, you can quickly navigate around 
really get a sense for what the landscape is like, the topology, um, and as well as the, as I say, as I click on this feature again, the corresponding data that's there. So in terms of understanding existing hydroelectric and um, understanding future potential, uh, it's got that capability where you can um, readily explore, navigate around from a desk and, and, and you know, do some uh, really worthwhile assessment and, and evaluation. So um, that is all of the use cases um, that I had to run through. Um, as I said at the start, hopefully it gives a really good insight in terms of the potential that this type of application has. Um, again, to emphasize, I am by no means an expert on this. It's literally just by having a play and running through that I've been able to give you this demonstration with the support of the pre-configured data story. Um, I think it's a, a fantastic platform and really does demonstrate the potential that we have um, with the, with the um, proof of concept and, and the proposals we have in the UK to start to develop this capability. So thank you for listening. I hope that was useful and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the session.